Section 10 of the Aeneid of Virgil. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Book 5, Part 2. This said Antellus for the strife prepares, stripped of his quilted coat, his body bears, composed of mighty bones and brawn he stands, a goodly towering object on the sands. Then just Aeneas equal arms supplied, which round their shoulders to their wrists they tied. Both on the tiptoe stand at full extent, their arms aloft, their bodies inly bent, their heads from aiming blows they bear afar, with clashing gauntlets then provoke the war. One on his youth and pliant limbs relies, one on his sinews and his giant size. The last is stiff with age, his motion slow, he heaves for breath, he staggers to and fro, and clouds of issuing smoke his nostrils loudly blow. Yet equal in success they ward, they strike, their ways are different, but their art alike. Before, behind, the blows are dealt, around their hollow sides the rattling thumps resound, a storm of strokes, well meant with fury flies, and errs about their temples, ears, and eyes. Not always errs, for oft the gauntlet draws a sweeping stroke along the crackling jaws. Heavy with age, Antellus stands his ground, but with his warping body wards the wound. His hand and watchful eye keep even pace, while Dares traverses and shifts his place. And, like a captain who beleaguers round some strong-built castle on a rising ground, views all the approaches with observing eyes, this and that other part in vain he tries, and more on industry than force relies. With hands on high, Antellus threats the foe, but Dares watched the motion from below, and slipped aside and shunned the long-descending blow. Entellus wastes his forces on the wind, and thus deluded of the stroke designed, headlong and heavy fell. His ample breast and weighty limbs his ancient mother pressed. So falls a hollow pine that long had stood on Ida's height or Eremanthus wood, torn from the roots. The differing nations rise, and shouts and mingled murmurs rend the skies. Acestus runs with eager haste to raise the fallen companion of his youthful days. Dauntless he rose, and to the fight returned. With shame his glowing cheeks, his eyes with fury burned. Disdain and conscious virtue fired his breast, and with redoubled force his foe he pressed. He lays on load with either hand amain and headlong drives the Trojan o'er the plain, nor stops, nor stays, nor rest, nor breath allows, but storms of strokes descend about his brows, a rattling tempest and a hail of blows. But now the prince, who saw the wild increase of wounds, commands the combatants to cease, and bounds in wrath and bids the peace. First to the Trojan, spent with toil, he came, and soothed his sorrow for the suffered shame. What fury seized my friend, the gods, said he, to him propitious and averse to thee, have given his arm superior force to thine, tis madness to contend with strength divine. The gauntlet fight thus ended from the shore, his faithful friends unhappy Dares bore. His mouth and nostrils poured a purple flood, and pounded teeth came rushing with his blood, Faintly he staggered through the hissing throng, and hung his head and trailed his legs along. The sword and cask are carried by his train, but with his foe the palm and ox remain. The champion then before Aeneas came, proud of his prize, but prouder of his fame. O goddess-born and you, Dardanian host, mark with attention and forgive my boast. Learn what I was, by what remains and know from what impending fate you save my foe. Sternly he spoke, and then confronts the bull, and, on his ample forehead aiming full, the deadly stroke descending pierced the skull. Down drops the beast, nor needs a second wound, but sprawls in pangs of death, and spurns the ground. Then thus, in Dare's stead I offer this, Eryx accept a nobler sacrifice, Take the last gift my withered arms can yield. Thy gauntlets I resign, and here renounce the field. This done, Aeneas orders for the close the strife of archers with contending bows. 
the mast Sergesthus shattered galley bore with his own hands he raises on the shore a fluttering dove upon the top they tie the living mark at which their arrows fly the rival archers in a line advance their turn of shooting to receive from chance a helmet holds their names the lots are drawn on the first scroll was read hippocon the people shout upon the next was found young menestheus late with naval honors crowned the third contained eurytion's noble name thy brother pandarus and next in fame whom pallas urged the treaty to confound and send among the greeks a feathered wound acestes in the bottom last remained whom not his age from youthful sports restrained soon all the vigor bend their trusty bows soon all with vigor bend their trusty bows and from the quiver each his arrow chose hippocons was the first with forceful sway it flew and whizzing cut the liquid way fixed in the mast the feathered weapon stands the fearful pigeon flutters in her bands and the tree trembled and the shouting cries of the pleased people rend the vaulted skies then menestheus to the head his arrow drove with lifted eyes and took his aim above but made a glancing shot and missed the dove yet missed so narrow that he cut the cord which fastened by the foot the flitting bird the captive thus released away she flies and beats with clapping wings the yielding skies his bow already bent eurytion stood and having first invoked his brother god his winged shaft with eager haste he sped the fatal message reached her as she fled she leaves her life aloft she strikes the ground and renders back the weapon in the wound acestes grudging at his lot remains without a prize to gratify his pains yet shooting upward sends his shaft to show an archer's art and boast his twanging bow the feathered arrow gave a dire portent and latter augurs judge from this event chafed by the speed it fired and as it flew a trail of following flames ascending drew kindling they mount and mark the shiny way across the skies as falling meteors play and vanish into wind or in a blaze decay the trojans and sicilians wildly stare and trembling turn their wonder into prayer the dardan prince put on a smiling face and strained acestes with a close embrace then honoring him with gifts above the rest turned the bad omen nor his fears confessed the gods said he this miracle have wrought and ordered you the prize without the lot except this goblet rough with figured gold which thracian Caseus gave my sire of old this pledge of ancient amity receive which to my second sire i justly give he said and with the trumpet's cheerful sound proclaimed him victor and with laurel crowned nor good eurytion envied him the prize though he transfixed the pigeon in the skies who cut the line with second gifts was graced the third was his whose arrow pierced the mast the chief before the games were wholly done called periphantes tutor to his son and whispered thus with speed ascanius find and if his childish troop be ready joined on horseback let him grace his grandsire's day and lead his equals armed in just array he said and calling out the cirque he clears the crowd withdrawn an open plain appears and now the noble youths of form divine advance before their fathers in a line the riders grace the steeds the steeds with glory shine thus marching on in military pride shouts of applause resound from side to side their casques adorned with laurel wreaths they wear each brandishing aloft a cornel spear some at their backs their gilded quivers bore their chains of burnished gold hung down before three graceful troops they formed upon the green three graceful leaders at their head were seen twelve followed every chief and left a space between the first young priam led a lovely boy whose grandsire was the unhappy king of troy his race in after times was known to fame new honors adding to the latian name and well the royal boy his thracian steed became white were the fetlocks of his feet before 
and on his front a snowy star he bore then beauteous atis with eulus bred of equal age the second squadron led the last in order but the first in place first in the lovely features of his face rode fair ascanius on a fiery steed queen dido's gift and of the tyrian breed sure coursers for the rest the king ordains with golden bits adorned and purple reins the pleased spectators peals of shouts renew and all the parents in the children view their make their motions and their sprightly grace and hopes and fears alternate in their face the unfledged commanders in their martial train first make the circuit of the sandy plain around their sires and at the appointed sign drawn up in beauteous order form a line the second signal sounds the troop divides in three distinguished parts with three distinguished guides again they close and once again disjoin in troop to troop opposed and line to line they meet they wheel they throw their darts afar with harmless rage and well dissembled war then and around the mingled bodies run flying they follow and pursuing shun broken they break and rallying they renew in other forms the military show at last in order undiscerned they join and march together in a friendly line and as the cretan labyrinth of old with wandering ways and many a winding fold involved the weary feet without redress in a round error which denied recess so fought the trojan boys in warlike play turned and returned and still a different way thus dolphins in the deep each other chase in circles when they swim around the watery race this game these carousels ascanius taught and building alba to the latins brought showed what he learned the latin sires impart to their succeeding sons the graceful art from these imperial rome received the game which troy the youths the trojan troop they name thus far the sacred sports they celebrate but fortune soon resumed her ancient hate for while they pay the dead his annual dues those envied rites saturnian juno views and sends the goddess of the various bow to try new methods of revenge below supplies the winds to wing her airy way wherein the port secure the navy lay swiftly fair iris down her arch descends and undiscerned her fatal voyage ends she saw the gathering crowd and gliding thence the desert shore and fleet without defence the trojan matrons on the sands alone with sighs and tears and Caesar's death bemoan then turning to the sea their weeping eyes their pity to themselves renews their cries alas said one what oceans yet remain for us to sail what labours to sustain all take the word and with a general groan implore the gods for peace and places of their own the goddess great in mischief views their pains and in a woman's form her heavenly limbs restrains in face and shape old beroe she became doricles wife a venerable dame once blessed with riches and a mother's name thus changed amidst the crying crowd she ran mixed with the matrons and these words began o wretched we whom not the grecian power nor flames destroyed in troy's unhappy hour o wretched we reserved by cruel fate beyond the ruins of the sinking state now seven revolving years are wholly run since this improsperous voyage we begun since tossed from shores to shores from lands to lands inhospitable rocks and barren sands wandering in exile through the stormy sea we search in vain for flying italy now cast by fortune on this kindred land what should our rest and rising walls withstand or hinder here to fix our banished band o country lost and gods redeemed in vain if still in endless exile we remain shall we no more the trojan walls renew or streams of some dissembled simois view haste join with me the unhappy fleet consume cassandra bids and i declare her doom in sleep i saw her she supplied my hands for this i more than dreamt with flaming brands 
With these, said she, these wandering ships destroy. These are your fatal seats, and this your Troy. Time calls you now, the precious hour employ. Slack not the good presage, while heaven inspires our minds to dare and gives the ready fires. See, Neptune's altars minister their brands. The god is pleased, the god supplies our hands. Then from the pile a flaming fire she drew, and tossed in air amidst the galleys threw. Wrapped in amaze, the matrons wildly stare. Then Pyrgo, reverenced for her hoary hair, Pyrgo, the nurse of Priam's numerous race, no Beroe this, though she belies her face. What terrors from her frowning front arise? Behold a goddess in her ardent eyes. What rays around her heavenly face are seen? Mark her majestic voice and more than mortal mien. Beroe, but now I left, whom pined with pain, Her age and anguish from these rites detain. She said, the matrons, seized with new amaze, roll their malignant eyes, and on the navy gaze. They fear and hope, and neither part obey. They hope the fated land, but fear the fatal way. The goddess, having done her task below, mounts up on equal wings, and bends her painted bow. Struck with the sight, and seized with rage divine, the matrons prosecute their mad design. They shriek aloud, they snatch with impious hands the food of altars, Fires and flaming brands, green boughs and saplings mingled in their haste, and smoking torches on the ships they cast. The flame unstopped at first more fury gains, and Vulcan rides at large with loosened reins. Triumphant to the painted sterns he soars, and seizes in this way the banks and crackling oars. Eumelus was the first the news to bear, while yet they crowd the rural theatre. Then what they hear is witnessed by their eyes, a storm of sparkles and of flames arise. Ascanius took the alarm, while yet he led his early warriors on his prancing steed, and spurring on his equals soon o'erpassed, nor could his frighted friends reclaim his haste. Soon as the royal youth appeared in view, he sent his voice before him as he flew, what madness moves you matrons to destroy the last remainders of unhappy Troy? Not hostile fleets, but your own hopes you burn, and on your friends your fatal fury turn. Behold your own Ascanius. While he said, he drew his glittering helmet from his head, in which the youths to sportful arms he led. By this Aeneas and his train appear, and now the women, seized with shame and fear, dispersed, to woods and caverns take their flight, abhor their actions, and avoid the light. Their friends acknowledge, and their error find, and shake the goddess from their altered mind. Not so the raging fires their fury cease, but lurking in the seams with seeming peace, work on their way amid the smouldering tow, sure in destruction, but in motion slow. The silent plague through the green timber eats, and vomits out a tardy flame by fits. Down to the keels and upward to the sails, the fire descends or mounts, but still prevails. Nor buckets poured, nor strength of human hand, can the victorious element withstand. The pious hero rends his robe and throws to heaven his hands, and with his hands his vows. O Jove, he cried, if prayers can yet have place, if thou abhorst not all the Darden race, if any spark of pity still remain, if gods are gods and not invoked in vain, yet spare the relics of the Trojan train, yet from the flames are burning vessels free, or let thy fury fall alone on me. At this devoted head thy thunder throw, and send the willing sacrifice below. Scarce had he said when southern storms arise, from pole to pole the forky lightning flies, Loud rattling shakes the mountains and the plain, Heaven bellies downward and descends in rain. Whole sheets of water from the clouds are sent, Which hissing through the planks the flames prevent, And stop the fiery pest. Four ships alone burn to the waste, And for the fleet atone. But doubtful thoughts the hero's heart divide, If he should still in Sicily reside. 
forgetful of his fates, or tempt the main, in hope the promised Italy to gain. The Nautes, old and wise, to whom alone the will of heaven by Pallas was foreshown, versed in portents, experienced, and inspired to tell events, and what the fates required. Thus while he stood, to neither part inclined, with cheerful words relieved his laboring mind. O goddess born, resigned in every state, with patience bear, with prudence push your fate. By suffering well our fortune we subdue, fly when she frowns, and when she calls pursue. Your friend Acastes is of Trojan kind, to him disclose the secrets of your mind, trust in his hands your old and useless train, too numerous for the ships which yet remain. The feeble, old, indulgent of their ease, The dames who dread the dangers of the seas, With all the dastard crew who dare not stand The shock of battle with your foes by land. Here you may build a common town for all, And from Acestes' name, Acesta call. The reasons, with his friends' experience joined, Encouraged much, but more disturbed his mind. Twas dead of night, when to his slumbering eyes his father's shade descended from the skies, and thus he spoke, O oh, more than vital breath, loved while I lived, and dear even after death, O oh, son, in various toils and troubles tossed, the king of heaven employs my careful ghost on his commands. The god who saved from fire your flaming fleet, and heard your just desire, the wholesome counsel of your friend receive, and here the coward train and woman leave. The chosen youth and those who nobly dare transport to tempt the dangers of the war. The stern Italians will their courage try. Rough are their manners, and their minds are high. But first to Pluto's palace you shall go, and seek my shade among the blessed below. For not with impious ghosts my soul remains, Nor suffers with the damned perpetual pains, But breathes the living air of soft Elysian plains. The chaste Sibylla shall your steps convey, And blood of offered victims free the way. There shall you know what realms the gods assign, And learn the fates and fortunes of your line. But now farewell, I vanish with the night, and feel the blast of heaven's approaching light. He said, and mixed with shades, he took his airy flight. Whither so fast the filial duty cried, And why, ah, oh, why the wish to embrace denied? He said, and rose, as holy zeal inspires, He rakes hot embers and renews the fires. His country gods and Vesta then adores With cakes and incense, and their aid implores. Next for his friends and royal host he sent, Revealed his vision and the gods' intent with his own purpose. All without delay the will of Jove and his desires obey. They list with women each degenerate name Who dares not hazard life for future fame. These they cashier, the brave remaining few, Oars, banks, and cables half consumed renew. The prince designs a city with the plough, the lots their several tenements allow, This part is named from Ilium, that from Troy, And the new king ascends the throne with joy. A chosen senate from the people draws, Appoints the judges, and ordains the laws. Then on the top of Eryx they begin A rising temple to the Paphian queen. Anchises last is honoured as a god. A priest is added, annual gifts bestowed, and groves are planted round his blessed abode. Nine days they pass in feasts, their temples crowned, And fumes of incense in the fanes abound. Then from the south arose a gentle breeze That curled the smoothness of the glassy seas. The rising winds a ruffling gale afford, And call the merry mariners aboard. Now loud laments along the shores resound Of parting friends in close embraces bound. The trembling women, the degenerate train, Who shunned the frightful dangers of the main. Even those desire to sail and take their share Of the rough passage and the promised war. Whom good Aeneas cheers and recommends To their new master's care his fearful friends. On Eric's altars three fat calves he lays, 
a lamb new fallen to the stormy seas then slips his halsers and his anchors weighs high on the deck the godlike hero stands with olive crowned a charger in his hands then cast the reeking entrails in the brine and poured the sacrifice of purple wine fresh gales arise with equal strokes they vie and brush the buxom seas and o'er the billows fly meantime the mother goddess full of fears to neptune thus addressed with tender tears the pride of jove's imperious queen the rage the malice which no sufferings can assuage compel me to these prayers since neither fate nor time nor pity can remove her hate even jove is thwarted by his haughty wife still vanquished yet she still renews the strife as if twere little to consume the town which awed the world and wore the imperial crown she prosecutes the ghost of troy with pains and gnaws even to the bones the last remains let her the causes of her hatred tell but you can witness its effects too well you saw the storm she raised on libyan floods that mixed the mounting billows with the clouds when bribing aeolus she shook the main and moved rebellion in your watery reign with fury she possessed the dardan dames to burn their fleet with execrable flames and forced aeneas when his ships were lost to leave his followers on a foreign coast for what remains your godhead i implore and trust my son to your protecting power if neither jove's nor fate's decree withstand secure his passage to the latian land then thus the mighty ruler of the main what may not venus hope from neptune's reign my kingdom claims your birth my late defence of your endangered fleet may claim your confidence nor less by land than sea my deeds declare how much your loved aeneas is my care thee xanthus and thee simois i attest your trojan troops when proud achilles pressed and drove before him headlong on the plain and dashed against the walls the trembling train when floods were filled with bodies of the slain when crimson xanthus doubtful of his way stood up on ridges to behold the sea new heaps came tumbling in and choked his way when your aeneas fought but fought with odds of force unequal and unequal gods i spread a cloud before the victor's sight sustained the vanquished and secured his flight even then secured him when i sought with joy the vowed destruction of ungrateful troy my will's the same fair goddess fear no more your fleet shall safely gain the latian shore their lives are given one destined head alone shall perish and for multitudes atone thus having armed with hopes her anxious mind his finny team saturnian neptune joined then adds the foamy bridle to their jaws and to the loosened reins permits the laws high on the waves his azure car he guides its axles thunder and the sea subsides and the smooth ocean rolls her silent tides the tempests fly before their father's face trains of inferior gods his triumph grace and monster whales before their master play and choirs of tritons crowd the watery way the marshalled powers in equal troops divide to right and left the gods his better side enclose and on the worse the nymphs and nereids ride now smiling hope with sweet vicissitude within the hero's mind his joys renewed he calls to raise the masts the sheets display the cheerful crew with diligence obey they scud before the wind and sail in open sea ahead of all the master pilot steers and as he leads the following navy veers the steeds of night had travelled half the sky the drowsy rowers on their benches lie when the soft god of sleep with easy flight descends and draws behind a trail of light thou palinurus art his destined prey to thee alone he takes his fatal way dire dreams to thee and iron sleep he bears 
and, lighting on thy prow, the form of Forbus wears. Then thus the traitor god began his tale. The winds, my friend, inspire a pleasing gale. The ships without thy care securely sail. Now steal an hour of sweet repose, and I will take the rudder and thy room supply. To whom the yawning pilot half asleep, me dost thou bid to trust the treacherous deep, the harlot smiles of her dissembling face, and to her faith commit the Trojan race? Shall I believe the siren south again, and oft betrayed not know the monster main? He said, his fastened hands the rudder keep, and fixed on heaven his eyes repel invading sleep. The god was wroth, and at his temples threw a branch in leaf dipped and drunk with Stygian dew. The pilot, vanquished by the power divine, soon closed his swimming eyes and lay supine. Scarce were his limbs extended at their length, the god, insulting with superior strength, fell heavy on him, plunged him in the sea, and with the stern the rudder tore away. Headlong he fell, and struggling in the main, cried out for helping hands, but cried in vain. The victor daimon mounts obscure in air, while the ship sails without the pilot's care. On Neptune's faith the floating fleet relies, but what the man forsook the god supplies, and o'er the dangerous deep secure the navy flies. Glides by the siren's cliffs a shelfy coast, long infamous for ships and sailors lost, and white with bones. The impetuous ocean roars, and rocks rebellow from the sounding shores. The watchful hero felt the knocks, and found the tossing vessel sailed on shoaly ground. Sure of his pilot's loss, he takes himself the helm, and steers aloof, and shuns the shelf. Inly he grieved, and, groaning from the breast, deplored his death, and thus his pain expressed. For faith reposed on seas and on the flattering sky, thy naked corpse is doomed on shores unknown to lie. End of section 10